I'm Dr. Eric Stewart from the Religion Department at Augustana College. I'd like to spend a few minutes with you today discussing the possibilities for decolonizing religious studies. The academic study of religion, like all academic disciplines, has a history. It does not arise from nowhere, and yet it is not always obvious what the objects and subjects of such studies are. It is important to acknowledge in this discipline, as in all others, the peoples, places, and things that we study are chosen, with greater or lesser care, within an already existing set of boundaries. As we think about religious studies within the confines of a teach-in about racial justice, it is important that we acknowledge how the creation of the discipline is implicated in European colonialist enterprises and what that means for whose interests the discipline represents. Religion, for most Americans today, is a voluntary practice undertaken, or not, by individuals due to their own understandings and beliefs about the nature of sacred beings and these beings' relation to reality. In other words, religion is non-compulsory, though some children might object to such a characterization, and centered on the beliefs of an individual. The definition on this slide, though admittedly scholarly in terms of its language, reflects the notion that the quintessence of religion is the beliefs, here in terms of conceptions, which serve to create moods and motivations of the individual. Religion is, in a word, interiorized in the most common understandings among present-day inhabitants of the United States. Religion has not always been understood in this way. As we can see from the quotations on this slide, when European colonialists first arrived in the Americas, in this case the Canary Islands and Peru, our earliest written records of these encounters show that the Europeans adjudged the natives not to have religion. Within a century of these judgments, treatises were being written describing the religions of the indigenous peoples. In the intervening period, the ritual practices of the native peoples of the Americas had not changed significantly. It was the understanding of what counted as religion in the minds of European colonizers that had changed. Jonathan Z. Smith has rightfully articulated that religion is not a native category. It is a comparative category imposed from the outside. It is, in the modern day, most often a category used by scholars or by people who want to make comparisons between those things they designate religion, between and among cultures. Smith calls religion a second-order concept used for establishing disciplinary boundaries. Talal Assad, reacting to the definition of Geertz we examined before, notes that the notion that religion is interiorized and primarily a matter of belief comes from a very specific historical and discursive process related to the Enlightenment in Europe. In the course of introducing a new kind of public discourse based upon the principles of observation rather than revelation, the initial steps were taken to move religion from a public element of society to a private matter of individual belief and conscience. It is in these steps that the notion of the secular is created, according to Assad, and he argues that this shift is not particularly helpful in understanding cultures that are not predominantly Christian. This shift did not occur all in one step, but it significantly influenced the way that European colonizers conceived of religion when they encountered indigenous peoples around the world. Assad, moreover, argues that the notion that religion as a fundamental feature of what it means to be human, found in the notion of natural religion, or Kant's notion that there is one true religion of which all historical enactments are vehicles, which may vary with differences in time and place, is one that can only arise in this period in European history. This type of Platonic form of religion, which for Kant includes religious texts, is one that, for Assad, has a specifically Christian character that elides questions about processes of power and knowledge. Assad argues that to segment society into secular and religious only makes sense in Western European and North American contexts. In fact, this understanding of religion is at the root of European and North American difficulties in understanding majority Muslim cultures for Assad. The notion that religion is located primarily in the belief of the individual 
only arises in European thinking at the same time as modern science, modern production, and the modern state. This way of understanding religion hides the operations of power inherent in these shifts and locates religion outside the public sphere. Tomoko Masuzawa has described the development of the concept of world religions in her book, The Invention of World Religions. Among the most important points she makes in this book is describing the period before the idea of world religions arose as one in which the religions of indigenous peoples, quite regularly called savages in that period, were lumped together as all belonging to the same basic pre-literate and pre-rational type. These societies, when compared by European scholars to Europe, were seen as simple, backward, and infantile. Moreover, because these tribal cultures were seen as representing a pre-rational phase of human existence, and the 19th and early 20th century anthropologists adopted a developmental framework for understanding human culture, these tribal cultures were seen as relics of a bygone era. When the notion of world religions developed in the early 20th century, these cultures' religions did not count as world religions because they were not deemed living religions in the sense of religions that had overcome tribal origins to be more ethnically expansive. Indigenous practices, worldviews, beliefs, divine beings, and histories, notably because such histories were not written in canonical divine books, were not part of the study of the world religions. Matsuzawa further tells us that, as part of the creation of the concept of world religions, Christianity was the first to be labeled a world religion. This fact is due to the presumed superiority of Christianity by Europeans in the second half of the 19th century. Not only was Christianity considered superior, however, a simultaneous understanding of human progress and development anticipated the end of religion, or at least its transformation to limit its influence over those areas of life considered secular. So some of the very same people stressing the superiority of religion were also anticipating the end of religion. A corollary is that these scholars of religion painted other peoples, non-Europeans, along with poor and uneducated members of their own societies, as under the sway of this backward concept called religion. These 19th century thinkers, among whom are included theological comparativists, adjudged all other religious traditions besides Christianity to be particular, bound, and shaped by geographical, ethnic, and other local contingencies. For this reason, the question of the place of Jews and Muslims in European society, also known as Christendom, became a lively topic of conversation, leading to all kinds of racist vitriol. In fact, it is in the attempt to distinguish Christianity as an Indo-European or Aryan tradition through its relation to Greek culture that the Semitic origins of Judaism and Islam come to be stressed. This move has the effect of both a supersessionist approach to Judaism, signaling that Christianity overcomes its Jewish roots, and a limiting of Muslims to an Arabian religion, even though then, as now, most Muslims in the world did not live in the Arabian Peninsula. The history of my discipline is overwhelmingly colonialist. The very notion that religion exists in all cultures in the world is a creation of 17th, 18th, and 19th century European colonizers. The notion that some of these aggregations of actions, relationships, histories, artifacts, and symbolic systems form the great religions of the world is a creation of the 20th century. What would it mean to decolonize such a discipline? It might mean at least two things. Mallory Nye distinguishes between two senses of decolonizing a discipline. The first he labels soft decolonizing. This type of decolonizing stresses the inclusion of more diverse voices within the academic study of religion, studying a broader range of peoples, practices, and places. A hard decolonizing is a much more difficult undertaking. It would threaten the very existence of a discipline whose origins are so deeply embedded in the colonialist enterprise. At the very least, Nye argues that decolonization must mean that scholars are aware of how their disciplines and institutions are implicated in colonializing projects. It's worth pausing at this point to ask the so what question. 
Why does any of this matter in an age in which we have come to stress interfaith cooperation on Augustana's campus? I have likely overwhelmed you with information in this brief presentation, perhaps information which you were not keen to learn in the first place. Yet, I think there are some very clear payoffs to knowing this type of thing. First, the place of Jews and Muslims within the framework of world religions has changed significantly in the 20th and 21st centuries. Yet we still often see remnants of the framework that treats the participants in these two traditions as backward and a threat to the United States and its culture. Examples abound, and they often involve violence. Two recent examples of horrifying othering of Jewish people came in the form of members of Unite the Right shouting, Jews will not replace us, in August of 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the dreadful killing of 11 members of the Tree of Life Synagogue just over one year later in October of 2018 in Pittsburgh. The shooter in the synagogue shooting claimed particular inspiration from John 8:44, which he claimed means that Jews are children of Satan. Obviously, most scholars of religion would never participate in these types of violent demonstrations and actions. There is a long history, however, of Christian understanding of Jews, influenced as it is by caricatures of Jewish leaders and people in the Christian Gospels, that suggests that Jews are legalistic. Descriptions of Judaism as a tribal religion in the 18th, 19th, and into the 20th century have surely helped to exacerbate a Christian understanding that Judaism is represented both fully and fairly in the Christian Gospels making it not unlike other tribal religions that do not count as living religions. While most Christians are not overtly anti-Judaic or anti-Semitic, the legacy of understanding of Judaism as parochial, legalistic, and other continues to exert a profound effect on our understandings of Judaism. The very notion that members of the Unite the Right group can chant, Jews will not replace us, leads us to ask the question, who is us? And why aren't Jews a part of that us? To be clear, I have no sympathy for the Unite the Right, nor any other white supremacist group, but we hear echoes of long-standing problematic understandings of the notion of religion in their chant. With respect to Muslims, I don't think it is difficult to find examples of Islamophobia especially in the wake of the terrible attacks of September 11th, 2001, Americans asked one another whether Islam was at war with the West. This type of Islamophobia, coupled with an almost total ignorance of Muslim practices, led to the death of Balbir Singh Sodi, a Sikh gas station owner in Mesa, Arizona, who was mistaken for a Muslim by his shooter. Significantly, the notion that Muslims are all Arabs along with other problematic stereotypes we heard about from Tomoko Masuzawa previously, have also limited our appreciation of Muslims' place in U.S. history. There were Muslims in America before America was officially a nation, and they have contributed much to the history and culture of this nation. On the place of Muslims in America, see Amir Hussein's very fine book, Muslims and the Making of America. Finally, lumping together indigenous peoples' religions into one category has meant that historians of religion have not always taken seriously self-reports and self-understandings of indigenous peoples. More problematically, the academic study of religion has involved far too few indigenous scholars. We, and by that I mean people like me, have far too often spoken for them in their place. Decolonizing religion, at a minimum, ought to mean a reconsideration of how we conceive of their own self-understandings. Also, it should lead us to asking the question of whether religion is the right category to understand meaningfully anything that happens in indigenous communities. If the category is not a native one, we have to build a clear justification for using it that takes into account its colonialist history. It may be that we can find no such justification. In the end, I want to say that I've learned these things about my discipline only in the last several years. I tell you that both to acknowledge that no one can know everything and that I am bound by my sense of racial justice to do this work. To the extent that I do not do it, I participate in a racist, colonialist discourse that has profound 
and sometimes fatal effects on people who are not in the majority in this country. The time and energy it takes to do this work is a very small price to pay to attempt to disrupt those effects.